Thank you, Mark. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 22 through 26, a brief passage, but one that explains one of the ordinances of the church. Mark just mentioned the two that we have, the Lord's Supper and baptism, and this is our Lord's explanation of the Lord's Supper, where He instituted that ordinance for the church. It's in the Passover. They've prepared the room. They've entered the upper room. And now we read in verse 22, while they were eating, he took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it. And he gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it. Let's bow in prayer. Many of you know the story, but... John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, understood how amazing it is. Before he became a hymn writer, he was a slave trader. And for a time, was himself a slave in Africa. But God delivered him from that hard bondage and then wonderfully saved him. He became a minister of the gospel and worked tirelessly to end the slave trade in England. He never lost his love for the grace of God that saved a wretch like him. And to assure that he never forgot, he painted on the plaster wall above his fireplace in his study, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 15. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the, slave of e- in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. One of the frequent commands of the Bible is to remember. The Passover was instituted as an annual celebration to help Israel do that. Remember that God redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. That's what the Lord's Supper is for the church. It is a memorial to remind us that Christ redeemed us from spiritual slavery just as those Passover lambs redeemed Israel from physical slavery. And there was no better place to institute the Lord's Supper to give it to the church than during the Passover, when the Lord could teach His disciples that the Passover lamb was a picture of Him. In fact, Luke recorded in his Gospel that Jesus said to His disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He was eager to spend his last hours with them around that table and the Passover lamb because he wanted to explain to them the ultimate meaning of Passover and how he fulfilled it. Well, that's the meaning of that celebration, because Paul later wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. All of those Paschal lambs that had been slain over the centuries pointed to this very moment and to this very purpose and what He would do at Calvary. It was an elaborate ceremony. It followed a certain pattern. Throughout the meal, there were four cups of wine to drink. It began with a prayer and the first cup of wine. Then there was instruction. All through the meal, there was instruction, explaining the symbolism of the elements on the table. The bitter herbs were eaten in remembrance of the bitterness of Israel's slavery in Egypt. Then one of the sons would ask the father, why is this night different from all other nights? And the father would explain the Passover, how 
The death angel moved through the land of Egypt, slaying the firstborn in every household. But the Hebrew homes escaped the plague. They were saved from death due to the blood of the lamb slain for the household and smeared on the top and sides of the door. Where the blood was, the angel of the Lord hovered over that house and sheltered it from judgment. Following the father's explanation, the family would sing the first part of the Hallel Psalms, the Psalms of Praise. Psalms 113 and 114, and drink the second cup of wine. Then they would eat the lamb and the unleavened bread, reminding them that they were delivered by God's sacrifice, fed by His bread, and left Egypt quickly at His command. The meal continued with the third cup of wine and concluded with singing the last of the Hallel Psalms, Psalm 115 through 118, and drinking the fourth cup of wine. In Mark's account, we come into the middle of the meal. While they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. William Hendrickson wrote that when he did that, when he broke the bread, the Passover passed over into the Lord's Supper. But the purpose of both of them is the same. Remembering. He said that. Luke's Gospel has a fuller account of the Lord's words. He said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, to a devout Jew, that would have been an astonishing statement. Jesus was telling His disciples, no longer remember the Passover lamb of Egypt. Remember Me in its place. Remember Me and the deliverance that I will bring to you. Now what man could have given such a command? Could have given a reasonable command like that? Well, only one. Only one who is more than a man, who is equal with God, his son, and the fulfillment of the Passover. But he kept the aspect of remembrance. And remembrance is reason enough for the supper because the danger of forgetting is deadly. Moses warned the nation early in the book of Deuteronomy, Give heed, he said, that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart. But not many years later, early in the days of the judges, we read, The sons of Israel forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals. Jesus was telling His disciples, telling us, telling the church, do this in remembrance of Me, lest you forget and drift off into error. That's plain enough, but what did He mean when He said, this is My body? Roman Catholicism has made much out of that simple statement and devised from it the doctrine of transubstantiation. And what that means is the bread literally becomes the body of Christ. It, it is transformed into that when the priest blesses it. And through his hands, he transfers saving power. Now that's called sacerdotalism, salvation through the sacraments. Protestants have a very different interpretation. They take the Lord's words figuratively as meaning this is the symbol of my body. The bread represents His body. And yet even among Protestants, there are some significant divisions and differences on that. Martin Luther, for example, took a kind of middle position with the doctrine of consubstantiation. Really, it's more like transubstantiation than, than a, a middle position because the word con in consubstantiation means with. So what Luther was saying is, the bread isn't Christ's body, but His body is literally with the bread in and around it. 
Luther's contemporary in Switzerland, the reformer Ulrich Zwingli, disagreed. And unfortunately, the issue caused a very sharp division between them and in the Reformation. They met in Marburg, Germany in the fall of 1529 to establish a doctrinal basis of unity for the Reformation. There was a list, list of 15 propositions. And they sat around a table for a few days discussing those propositions, and they agreed on 14 of the 15. The one issue on which they could not agree was the nature of the Lord's Supper and the meaning of the Lord's words. Swingley argued that Jesus spoke figuratively, and the supper was merely a remembrance. It is a memorial of his death. Then Luther stood up in a bit of drama and he took a piece of chalk and he wrote on the table where they were sitting the Latin words, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. He interpreted it literally. The Lord's body and blood were actually in the bread and wine. Both stood their ground, neither convinced the other, and the conference broke up with the Germans and the Swiss divided over the issue of the Lord's Supper. But there are good reasons for interpreting the Lord's statement in a non-literal sense, as meaning the bread represents my body. The Lord frequently used the word is in that way of symbolism. For example, in Matthew 13, he told a parable about a field. And then in verse 38, he said, the field is the world. Well, not literally, figuratively, figuratively, it represents the world. The Lord frequently spoke figuratively of himself. He said, I am the door, I am the way, I am the vine, I am the bread of life. All of those statements are obviously figuratively. Jesus was not saying that he was a literal door or road or vine or loaf of bread. It's the same language here. And likewise, not literal. I think we, we see that from the use of, his, uh, of Scripture and the way he speaks, but there's also the inescapable logic of the the figurative interpretation, because when he spoke these words to the disciples, he was before them in his body, holding the bread in his physical hand. The two were completely distinct from one another. The bread wasn't his body. He was telling the disciples that the bread of the Passover represented him. It was a prophecy of him. As bread sustains physical life, so too he is the source of spiritual life. He, he stated it so starkly because he wanted them to think about that and think deeply on it. Do this in remembrance of me. Think deeply on these things. Remember them. When Paul gave instruction on the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, he repeated that command by the Lord. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now that explains the nature of the Lord's Supper. And it explains the, the reason for the Lord's Supper. It's not a sacrament that imparts grace or spiritual life for salvation because his physical body is consumed. The bread is only a symbol of Christ. And the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of who He is and what He has done. It is an occasion for us to think, to reflect upon Him and His sacrifice. And again, that is very important because we are always in danger of forgetting and allowing something else to occupy our thoughts and something else to take our affections, and then we begin to drift and wander from the faith. Well, the Lord did the same with the wine in verses 23 and 24. And when He had taken a cup and given thanks, He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And He said to them, This is My blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. 
Again, the wine is no more his literal blood than the bread is his literal body. The cup of wine represented his blood, which means it represented his death, but a specific kind of death. Blood poured out speaks of violence. Blood that's shed. Just as bread that is broken symbolizes the breaking or the wounding of his body, the wine represented his blood shed in the violent death of a sacrifice. And it would be shed in death for others as a substitute, poured out for many, he said. Just as the Passover lamb was a substitute for the firstborn of the Jewish household, it, it died in the place of that child, so too the Lord died in our place. For all who believe in Him, for His elect. And through His sacrifice, He, sta he established a covenant. He, he put us, His chosen people, in a new relationship with God. The cup of wine, he said, is my blood of the covenant. That statement is probably intended to recall the words of Moses in Exodus 24, verse 8, when after receive, receiving the Ten Commandments, he confirmed Israel's covenant with God at Mount Sinai. He first read the law to the people, and then he took the blood of sacrificed bulls, and he sprinkled the blood on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant. And the covenant was thereby ratified. That established the covenant with Israel. Generally, covenants are like that covenant. They are contracts or agreements between two people who promise to, to keep their end of the bargain. And Israel promised to keep all the commandments. God would bless them, but they must keep all the commandments, not just the Ten Commandments, all of the commandments of the Mosaic Law, and keep them fully and perfectly. Israel didn't do that. Israel couldn't keep its agreement. It constantly failed to obey the law. It continually broke the covenant, broke it repeatedly. So a new covenant was needed the one that the Lord came to establish. It was promised in the Old Testament. It was promised in Jeremiah chapter 31. It's called the New Covenant. And it was completely different from the old one made at Mount Sinai. The New is all about grace. It's all about sovereign grace. In fact, it wasn't really an agreement between two parties, between God and His people. It was a promise from God that He would bless. He would bless His people unconditionally. So it is called a unilateral covenant. He promised, He would establish it. That is very important. In Jeremiah 31, God promised to forgive the people's sins and empower them to obey Him. He would do what the law could not do. He would write the law on their hearts and He would erase their sins. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Cast them behind His back, as the prophets put it. Separate them as far as the east is from the west. Cast them into the depths of the sea. Forget them altogether. The Old Covenant couldn't do that. The law couldn't do that. It had multitudes of goats and lambs and bulls sacrificed over the centuries of time for the sins of the people, rivers of blood. But they couldn't remove sin. They had to be repeated over and over again. And the fact that they were repeated proves that the blood of a goat cannot take away the sins of men and women. And they weren't intended to. They weren't designed to do that. They were intended to be and designed to be pictures of Christ like the Passover lamb was. His sacrifice did remove our sins. It, 
is the once for all sacrifice and never to be repeated because it is the all sufficient sacrifice. And he declared that from the cross when he said, it is finished. There's nothing more to be done. No more sacrifices to be made. Nothing more for you to do. It's done. It's finished. Christ's blood made an actual atonement for sin. It actually satisfied God's justice. The Lord's sacrifice propitiated God for all those for whom He died, which means it satisfied His justice and turned away His wrath from His people. His death obtained salvation. It achieved salvation. You don't achieve it through your faith. He has achieved it. You receive it through faith. Well, that's, that's the statements of Scripture, Old and New Testament. By His stripes we are healed, Isaiah said. By His wounds you are healed, Peter said. His sacrifice saves. Salvation occurred at the cross. Does it save all? No. He saves His elect and saves all of them. His sacrifice was designed for a specific people. As the angel told Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, He will save His people from their sins. That's the explicit statement of Scripture. I believe particular redemption is the logical explanation that follows from election. And election follows naturally from the doctrine of total depravity, which may be better explained as total inability. But if we're totally unable to respond, we must be elected. And if we're elected, and not everyone is elected, then certainly He didn't die for all without exception, but all without distinction. He died for His people. Having said that, we should not think that His people, that His elect ones, are just a few small group. His people are many. They're described in various ways, as you know, as like the stars of the heaven, an innumerable multitude, like the sand of the seashore, like the dust of the earth. And all who want salvation can have it through faith in Christ because the elect believe. They were chosen from eternity by God for salvation. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. From the foundation of the world, from all eternity. But they, we, were not chosen simply for salvation, but for salvation through faith. That's how we obtain it. He obtained salvation for us through His death. We receive it from Him through faith. A person must believe in Christ to be saved. But election assures that those chosen by God will believe. It's what the elect do. They are people of faith. They believe. So, if there's anyone here who has not believed but wants the forgiveness of sin and wants the life that Christ gained for His people, wants to know that he or she is elect, then believe. And He will receive you. He receives all who come to Him. He rejects none. And He keeps them forever. That's what He gives. Eternal life, not temporal life. Now that's our hope as believers in Jesus Christ. This world is not all there is or ever will be. This world is transient. It's passing away. There is a world to come. There is a kingdom to come. The kingdom of God. That is our hope. And that is what Jesus spoke of next and where He ended His lesson on remembering His death and their deliverance after giving them the cup of wine and telling them all to drink. He said, Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He didn't drink the fourth cup knowing that he would drink it later. So he knew death was not the end. He knew that that fourth cup would be drunk by him 
because he would live again. And there, there was no uh, equivocation in any of this. He, do, he doesn't hedge or show any ambivalence in what he's saying here. He was absolutely certain. It was a fact. He had come into the world to do the very things that he speaks of here. His death was not some mistake of history. It was planned. He came into the world to die. That, that was, as I say, the plan. It was revealed in the Old Testament. It was announced to Joseph. He will save his people from their sins. Oh, that's the death. But it's not just that. He knew that there was more to the plan than that, that there was life to come for him because Gabriel told Mary before his birth, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Jesus knew that he would die and he knew that he would have that throne and he will have it. He could not fail. He could not fail because he is God's eternal son. And all those for whom he died and whom he saved will be with him in the kingdom of God. We can rest in that and we can rejoice in that. And that too is what we are to reflect upon when we remember Christ, when we take the Lord's Supper, when we remember His sacrifice for us, that we as a result of what He has done have a glorious future in the kingdom to come. So we not only look back to the past, we look forward to the future. We not only think of the cross and His suffering, we also think of the crown and the glory to come. What he is speaking of here is reunion that will occur with Christ and His people. It will be a joyful moment, and it won't be just a moment. It will be something that goes on for all eternity, world without end. It, it will never grow old. It will only become fresh and glorious increasingly. It will be so for all eternity. The Passover and the Lord's Supper ended as the Passover normally did with the singing of the Psalms. And then they left the upper room for the Mount of Olives where there was a garden. James Webb is a former United States Senator from Virginia and also a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. He was a Marine and he wrote a best-selling novel on the war, on the war titled Fields of Fire. He said regarding the war, the first duty is to remember. Many agreed. And so in 1982, they built the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument. It's simple. You are all familiar with it. It's just a, a wall of black granite inscribed with the names of those killed or missing in action. People come to it and, and they reach out to a, a particular name and they touch it. They're remembering someone. That's what we do in the Lord's Supper. It is a memorial. But this memorial is different from any national monument or memorial raised in remembrance of uh, brave warriors. This is not a structure but a simple ceremony observed in locations across the world by specific people, the redeemed, remembering their Redeemer. Who He is, what He did, what He will yet do. And for us, I think it is also true. The first duty is to remember. It is the first duty because it is what the Lord instructed us to do. It's what He desires that we do routinely. We must remember all that He did. Who He is and what He has accomplished for us. We need to remember that, not only because He instructed us to do that, but because it is also for our good to do that. He did everything in salvation. And that's what we reflect upon. And I think he signified that very clearly in the way that he introduced the supper. 
Mark wrote, Jesus took some bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it. In the same way with the cup of wine. He took it. He gave thanks for it. He gave it to the disciples. He told them to drink because it was His blood poured out for them. He poured it out. His death was a voluntary sacrifice for them. He took it on Himself to do it and did it gladly. But each of those gestures in the supper signified a basic fundamental truth that you must understand if you are ever to truly understand the gospel of salvation, and that is God always takes the initiative. He always takes the first action. He must, because we cannot. And if He did not, we would be forever lost and ruined in sin. But He took the first action. God the Father acted first in eternity past when He chose a people for Himself. He chose us individually. He chose us personally. He chose us unconditionally. It had nothing to do with us, everything to do with His grace and love. And that's the only reason we choose Him. We love because He first loved us, John says. He acted first in time when He sent His Son into the world to seek and save the lost, to, to save His people from their sins, which He did on the cross of Calvary. He accomplished that. He saved us there. The resurrection is the historical proof that He succeeded, that the Father accepted His sacrifice for us and and that all of our sins are paid for and removed forever and forgotten altogether. We're to remember that He has forgotten. So this is what we're to think about. This is what we're to reflect upon. What is so important that we remember routinely that we were slaves in darkness and helpless. And the Lord our God redeemed us. Sent His only begotten Son. And His Son came. Not out of compulsion, but out of joy. For the joy set before Him. And through His death, He snatched us like brands from the burning. He did it all. We are absolutely dependent upon Him for everything. Christ is the eternal Son of God. He is our Creator and our Redeemer. He is worthy of our remembrance. It's true. The first duty is to remember. But it's also necessary for our own welfare. The more we remember, the more we learn. And the more we appreciate who the Lord is and what He has done for us, and then the more grateful we naturally become and the more faithful we will be, and the more fruitful we will be. In 20 years from now, or 50 years from now, I don't know how many people will stand at the Vietnam Wall looking at it, touching names, and remembering those events of a faraway land. But I suspect not many. In fact, I suspect not any. Memories fade, and the significance of those events is lost. And that's typical. That's generally the case. So in many of the war remembrance services, especially among the British, a phrase from a poem by Rudyard Kipling is used. It is, lest we forget, Lord God of hosts be with us yet, Lest we forget, lest we forget. It's always a danger for a nation to forget its past, to forget its warriors, forget all those who have given their blood in service for their nation, forget the sacrifice made, forget the reasons for the war. More importantly, that is always the danger for God's people. Jesus knew that. So he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. 
May we never stop doing that, lest we forget. Shortly before he died, John Newton wrote a friend, My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Remember that. Is He your Savior? If not, look to Him. Believe in Him. Don't worry about election. Think about it. It's true. But if you want to know if you're elect, believe. He shed His blood to save all who believe in Him. He opens His arms open to everyone who comes. So trust in Him. He'll receive you. And then, remember Him. May God help all of us to do that. Well, I mentioned John Newton a couple of times, and we all know his great hymn, Amazing Grace. Let's stand and sing hymn number 227 in the Red Book, Amazing Grace, and then remain standing for the benediction. <coughs> Ten thousand years, ten million years, eternity, Lord, you have given us to sing praise to you. We will never get tired of doing that. We will only get better at doing that because we'll learn more and more about you and your grace and all that you've achieved for us through the blood of your Son opening up heaven for us. What a, what a thought. We can't even comprehend it. But we can say thank you. And we do. Thank you for the blood that was shed for us. The gift that's received through faith alone. Thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.